Starlink a bit doomed? Not so fast. I'm Brian. Welcome to my Tesla weekend. As a reminder, you are watching the full version that goes out Friday live, or maybe you're watching the replay over the weekend on the main channel, My Tesla Weekend. It's whichever one's on the screen. Second channel is a lot of fun if you haven't checked it out, although I feel silly saying that because the only people I'm saying it to right now are watching it on the second channel. SpaceX just lost up to 80% of its recently launched Starlink satellites. Here's why. That, my friend, is clickbait. That makes it sound like they lost thousands of satellites when in fact they lost 40 of the 49 that had been launched due to a solar flare. That's not a bad thing. I mean, it is in a small way, but really it's proof of concept of the constellation. Starlink is impossible. I don't know if you know this, but it is impossible. You wanna cover the whole planet in relatively fast, relatively affordable internet, do you know how many satellites you're gonna need? Like, more than exists. SpaceX could go bankrupt if production issues persist. Oh, doom, it's doom and gloom, my friends. Well, this was an internal email. And Elon loves to send these to motivate the crew. And it works. Um, he'd said the same thing during production hell for the Model 3. Uh, and even though he said we were weeks from bankruptcy, mm, no, you were weeks from getting another loan or doing another stock offering. You weren't actually weeks from bankruptcy. I mean, technically, sure, but the Raptor production crisis is much worse than it seemed a few weeks ago. It's unclear how likely bankruptcy would actually be. But now, we're kind of past that. Is Starlink doomed to modest success? I love it. It's modest clickbait. It's not bad. It's not bad on the scale of clickbait. But, you know, <clears throat> will, will Starlink ever be better than so-so? Will it ever be more profitable than so-so? The answer is yeah. Yeah. In terms of percentages, rocket companies aren't generally very, very profitable. In terms of sheer dollars, they are, because the dollars are huge. But in terms of percentage, not so much. Starlink will change that. Well, what is the actual scale of Starlink? Because remember, we were talking about this just a second ago. It's impossible. You can't do it. You would need to have 11 kajillion satellites. And when they submitted their proposal to the FCC, to get bandwidth, they said, yeah, we're going to launch a few thousand satellites and then a few thousand more. And everyone, rightfully, was skeptical. How many satellites are orbiting the Earth in 2021? Now, this is after Starlink had launched an awful lot. How many satellites do you think were actually up there? Operational ones. 3,372 total worldwide since forever. And that includes a bunch of the Starlink ones. Well, Starlink is already at about 2,300. Starlink is already over half of the operational satellites in orbit. And just kind of for fun, you know, Elon owns roughly 50% of SpaceX. So Elon, personally, is the majority owner of the majority of satellites in orbit that are operational. And it ain't slowing down. That's just kind of crazy to wrap your head around, isn't it? Look at how many there are. This is a neat one. I'll put the link in the description. Starlink.sx. It shows the position of all the satellites overhead at any given time and where the connection is to the nearest ground station. There's all the satellites that I'm talking to right now, potentially, on Starlink, which is amazing when you consider how often we run into buffering issues. Another one, this is uh, satellitemap.space. This shows you, in clearer dots, all of the satellites. And these long strings are recently launched trains, as it were, 
that have not yet gone all the way up into their respective orbits. But you can see that's a lot of recent launches, man. And all those dots, every single dot is a satellite run by Starlink. Elon says SpaceX will double Starlink satellite internet speeds later this year. Now, I assume he means the 500 a month plan because the speeds are... Starlink US download speeds drop, but service blasts broadband out of the park globally. So this is a neat article. It explains that, yeah, uh, in Q3 of 2021, uh, speeds were down. 10%. That's not bad. The down speed, I don't mind. I don't have any issues streaming 4K video. Uh, I don't have any problems downloading large files. My problem is the upload speed, which is painful. The median download speed for customers was 104.97 megabits per second. And if you compare that to other satellite providers, it's a fantastic speed. The ping is better than any other satellite provider. The bandwidth is not only faster, but unlimited. Unlimited bandwidth is huge. My cousins had, I don't know, one of the satellite providers for their cabin, and I believe their cap was two gigs a month. Two gigs. Yeah, we just use it for email. They have Starlink now. They love it. They are as connected as they would be at home. So I ran a speed test just to see. 26 milliseconds for the ping, 96 down, 11 and a half up. Not too shabby. Kind of in line with what I guess I'm supposed to expect. But I swear it was faster early on. When I go to upload a big file, oh, it's painful. Starlink, this is exciting, in March, reached a quarter million subscribers. That's great. That's a much higher number than I was expecting. And I would consider dropping it if there was a reasonably priced, faster option available that didn't have a data cap. Data caps, there's six of us in the house. We need no data caps. The quarter million was very exciting from March until this came out. Now it's at 400,000. They picked up 150,000 subscribers in the last two months. Oh, this is happening. And just 2% of Starlink users live outside of the West. That means there's so much addressable market. So much. If you look at the map, the global map, you can see North America, yep, available. Puerto Rico, yes. Rest of the Caribbean, it'll come on. South America, yeah, why not? Africa, it's just waiting. It's just waiting. China might be a more uh, impossible nut to crack. They're launching their own constellation, or hoping to, and they may just not want outsiders participating in the transmission of data over their land. Russia may be in the same boat. We shall see. But there's a lot of addressable market that hasn't been touched yet. So 400,000 times 120 bucks, that's uh, 48 million a month. It's over a half billion a year. A half a bubba, a billion smackaroo bobs. And we're potentially looking at doubling that by the end of the year. A half a billion, that covers, what, 17 launches with satellites? Double that to a million? You're covering your whole year's manifest. SpaceX satellites could cost 250000 each, and Falcon 9, less than 30 million. Yeah, the entire launch could be 30 million for 40, 50 satellites. That's way under a million dollars a satellite delivered. How do you get that cheap? So one of the ways is an assembly line. Making one of something costs more than making 10, and making 10 of something costs more per unit than making 100 or 1,000. Each order of magnitude, you get huge savings. And it allows you to iterate while you're going. The or original Starlink satellites didn't have frickin' space lasers. The newer ones do. That's exciting stuff. I had read early criticisms that said Starlink would never work because each satellite, I mean, what does a satellite cost to launch? A hundred million? 
well, let's say they can do it really well and it's 10 million. They need a thousand satellites. That's what, that's $10 billion. Really, they need 2,000 satellites. That's $20 billion. Guys, 20 billion in the scheme of space is nothing. 20 billion in the scheme of telecom is nothing. But they're doing it for a tenth of that price. But here's the real problem. SpaceX to leverage Starship for second gen Starlink constellation. Now, it goes a little further. Not only does Elon want to use Starship, in the video, which you may have seen, this is on uh, Everyday Astronauts channel, Elon said Starship is critical to Starlink 2.0. The satellite is significantly bigger and bulkier and more heavy and expensive. And I don't know if you've seen this video, but it's a great one. What a view. But Starlink is not going to hinge on whether or not Starship can launch. Man, that's a big tower. If Starship doesn't work, it doesn't mean SpaceX and Starlink collapse. It means they stick with the version 1.5 satellites instead of the 2.0. The 2.0 will have vastly higher throughput. And this is helpful because putting up 40,000 satellites would be great, but it'd be better to put up 5,000 with the capacity of 50,000. Another way it's cheap is because typically with a satellite, you have to over-engineer the heck out of it. You have to make it extremely reliable. Because if you spend $100 million and it fails, you're done. But if we go back to here, you can see from this block of 1,500 satellites, 221 failed. That's 15%. From this block of 800, hmm, only 5% failed. Getting better. When they're cheap enough, they don't have to be perfect. If you can cut the price by half and only lose 10%, you're coming out ahead. Let's do another speed test. 37 milliseconds, fine. 60 down, eight and a half up, uh, not great. Now let's get into the real FUD. Kessler syndrome. Oh, the sun. Elon's Starlink satellites could stop us spotting asteroids and trap us on Earth, experts warn. Unnamed experts. Oh, look at this mess. So humans or hmm, physics doesn't come naturally to us. It's something that we kind of have to study a bit and learn to understand. But what we're really bad at is understanding objects in four dimensional space. And I don't mean an extra dimension. I mean 3D plus time. And you could say, well, right. But if you throw me a ball, I can catch it. Cool. Close one eye and try it. Because when you look at this picture, you're looking at a, at a flat representation of a 3D space, not even a 4D space. Each dot here should be the size of a dining room table. That's about the size of a Starlink. It's about the size of a dining room table. But this dot makes it look like it persists a kilometer behind it, or a thousand kilometers behind it. And in U.S., that'd be, I think, one gigabig Mac. Yeah, I think that's right. So it's very hard. Uh, when you look at those old World War II uh, video, uh, movies, where you see the tracer rate rounds that they put so they could shoot down aircraft, those were necessary because humans couldn't, without seeing that tracer and being able to place it with your eyeballs in stereoscopic vision, you couldn't see where the bullets were actually going. And hitting an object moving through 3D space plus time is very difficult. In space, a near miss is a mile. If a pebble comes within a mile of your spacecraft, that was a near miss. Space is very big and it's very empty. If someone shot a bullet a mile away from your dining room table, would you call it a near miss? What if it was actually a mile above your dining room table? Would you call that a near miss? And as big as the Earth is, the space around it is slightly larger. I saw a post where a guy said, oh, all China would need to do to take out all of Starlink is do a single launch and scatter a bunch of ball bearings, a million ball bearings on that orbital plane and it'll take them all out. No, it would not. That is not how space works at all. The ideas to clean up space debris are noble, but you would have to do 
almost as many launches as have been done in history to clean up space debris, because cha just changing your inclination takes, in depending, more energy than has ever been expended to go to orbit. How long will orbital debris remain in Earth orbit? This is from a little, little organization called NASA. I'm not sure what that stands for. Need another space association. New American Space Astronauts of America. Debris left in orbit below 370 miles, 600 kilometers, normally falls back to Earth within several years. That is where SpaceX is. They're around the 540 to 550 kilometer range. They deorbit themselves. The ones that have failed have already completely or partially decayed their orbit and will be gone soon. Altitudes of 500 miles, it's measured in decades, and at 1,000 kilometers, it will continue circling for a century or more, which, by the way, is where Jeff Bezos's uh, little OneWeb system is going to be. So give him some flack, would you? The Kessler thing, grossly overblown by people who have never played Kerbal and do not know physics. Let's do one more speed test, mm, but quick. But first, a quick thanks to my Patreons who get early access, bonus content, ad-free experience, all that good stuff. Keep the channel running. It is difficult to keep things going when enthusiasm is low. When the stock is down, interest is down, views are down, it's all down. And I get a little down myself. Well, the there it is, days. and mm. there you go. If you want to see the full, uncut, 30-ish minute version of this episode, head over to the second channel, link in the description, and subscribe over there if you want to catch these live each Friday at 7 p.m. Pacific, as well as the Fast Charging with B&B &B podcast, co-hosted with Bear from Bear's Workshop. So... What did I miss or misunderstand? Tell me in the comments and stay tuned, stay juicy, and I can't wait to hear from you clever robots on the other side.